so much. And again, thanks for everyone for being with us. We are so excited to have an opportunity to be in community today. And again, those of you who, who are just joining us, um, welcome. We have all kinds of um, stuff we want to talk about today, but we also want to make sure that we don't just spend a bunch of time talking about collaboration, but actually we also create space to really build and begin to engage in collaboration. So um, let me start us off by by just, again, welcoming folks who are here to, to jump in the chat and say your name, your role, um, anything else about yourself that you think might be interesting. Um, and, and as you do that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just kind of give you an overview of where we're headed um, this afternoon um, so that you have a chance to, to, to sort of get a sense of our scope. So at, before I do that, I'm Amanda Taylor, she and hers. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here at AU and a faculty member in the School of International Service. I'm so delighted to be joined by my colleagues um, from the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion here, who you see um, on your screen. And they're gonna be introducing themselves um, in much more detail later on as we dive into the presentation. So let me share my screen here and we'll get started. Okay, so let me get the show going. Okay. Can everyone, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see this? Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay. So we are here today, just to make sure you're in the wrong session. This is like when you get on a plane and you're like, am I flying to the right place? What we're here to talk about today is um, collaborating for inclusive excellence at AU and how the President's Council on Diversity and Inclusion, a group that we refer to as PCDI in our land of acronyms in which we live, um, how we're sort of working to and aiming to collaborate cross-school collaborations that advance equity here at AU and, and also how you can get involved. So what we're hoping to do in the time we've got together is really hope that you'll leave with a sense of, okay, what is this PCDI thing and what is its relationship to the Inclusive Excellence Plan? Um, and then also that you'll leave with some ideas for opportunities for how we can begin to enhance and deepen collaborations for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at AU, and, and even get some ideas for best practices, right? What, how do we start think about this idea of collaboration? It's one of those words like community that we use all over the place, but what do we actually mean when we say that, right? What is, what is the intention behind this work and what is our vision for where we wanna be? Um, so what we're gonna do in terms of an agenda is um, we're gonna sort of start with just a, a little bit of framework that, that, that I'll talk about around, again, kind of defining our terms and, and setting some, some context for the conversation around what does it mean to collaborate for equity. Um, and then I'm gonna turn to my colleagues on the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion, and they're all gonna talk about some key actions for equitable collaboration that um, they are leading in their various schools and colleges uh, where they sit um, around two particular themes. We're gonna talk about um, inclusive hiring and retention, and then we're gonna talk about building community and belonging as sort of two, two key parts of, of really how we're, we're working together um, and collaborating to advance these, these shares goals that we've got. And you'll hear lots of good examples from them and get to know them a little bit more um, as, as um, we move through. And then we're going to spend really a good 30 minutes in our session in small group uh, collaborative breakouts where it's like we're going to be led and, and um, facilitated by our President's Council on Diversity and Inclusion colleagues here. Um, but really, this is the time to do some of that collaboration, not just sort of talk about it, but actually begin to, to really incubate it. And we'll close with some next steps like what now? What can I do? What actions can I take? How can I stay engaged? So we'll leave you with some concrete ideas for how we can move forward on that front. Okay, so let me get started here and just just frame out for a few minutes, um, you know, where we're headed and, and where we're going. So, um, you know, most of you probably know that the Inclusive Excellence Plan uh, has five big goals. If you haven't heard about it, if you don't live it and breathe it like I do every single day, um, and many of us do, in 20, a little bit of history is in 2018, um, President Burrell started at AU in 2017. Um, and it was a moment for our campus when we really were at what I would call kind of our racial reckoning, I think at AU on many on many levels. Um, and and we had had some really horrific um, 
racist incidents on campus. And it was really clear that this was sort of touching a nerve for our institution, right? And it really helped raise um, for the institution um, a lot of the, the history, right? And a lot of, of, of folk, things that folks have been feeling for many, many years um, um, in terms of a sense of um, lack of belonging, lack of equity, how that showed up in, in terms of, of sort of um, racism, but also love other forms of hate and discrimination and just a sort of lack of sense of, of really being a part of this place, right? So it became this real touch point for our institution. And, you know, work for diversity, equity, inclusion at AU has been going on since AU started, right? I mean, this is really so much a part of, of who we are from our founding, even as we are also founded as a institution of higher education. And we know what that means in terms of, you know, the ways that dominant ideas, um, you know, white supremacy and, and lots of other forms of, um, uh, of sort of oppression sort of tend to get baked into institutional practices and procedures, right? So AU has had this as a part of our history, both sort of resistance against this, but also really a reflection of what's been going on um, for institutions of higher education really um, since their inception, right? And, and the ways these two things are constantly um, working together. But this moment of 2017 um, and 2018 became a time for AU to really step back and say, um, say, hey, we've got to take a more systemic approach to this, right? We, we can't just be doing these small pockets. And the pockets of work had been incredible that had been going on um, since, since AU's founding, right? There's been really phenomenal work done by all of those who've gone before. Um, and that that will that has really set the main foundation for this work. And we want to honor those who've come before. Um, and yet we said, you know what, um, this is the time for, for systemic work. This is time for us to come together and really say, what is our strategy together for like really moving the work forward? And so the Inclusive Excellence Plan was launched in 2018. Um, and it, it was really designed um, to move institutional transformation, right? So how do we change this whole thing that we call the university, right? Across lots of different pockets. And so it was organized. And if you check it out, um, maybe some of my good colleagues could drop it in the chat, um, a link to the plan. I'm not that good at uh, multitasking here. But if you check it out, um, you can see there's sort of five domains of work. Right? One is like, what do we do? What makes us AU, right? First one is... Um, Obviously, we're a place of learning, right? We're a place of learning, not just in our curriculum, but also as an institution, as faculty and staff and administrators, right? We are engaged in the work of learning. So what does it look like for us to really come to understand um, the world, ourselves, um, what we do in a way that centers um, our commitments to inclusive excellence? The second domain is around campus culture, climate, and community. And this is, you know, how do people, what is what is the culture here? How do, pe how do we tend to feel? What feels quote unquote normal? right here at AU? What are the ways we do things? How do people feel um, when they're a part of this place, right? Are we connected to each other? What kinds of relationships do we have? What are the nature of those relationships? So that's like the second domain of work that's that you'll see in the Inclusive Excellence Plan. The third is around policies, procedures, and practices. And that's really the idea that that's kind of like the infrastructure, right? How do we build this place? What are the governing ideas? What are the policies? How do we do stuff here? Right, and what are the guidelines that structure how we do things in more formal and informal ways? Right, so there's an intention there to work on some of our policies and practices, um, and then there's work around access and equity, right? Which is to say, who's got the opportunity to be here? Faculty, staff, students, right? Um, and and who doesn't? And how do we address those those barriers head on? And then equity in terms of outcomes, right? How do we make sure that the um, opportunity to have an incredible experience at AU, whether you're a faculty member, a staff member, a student, or an alumni, um, is not uneven based on any aspect of your social identity or lived experience, right? So how do we really intentionally get at that? And then the fifth domain is really around our work as an institution for, um, we are we also create knowledge, right? And we, we, we help to advance scholarship and creative work out in the world. So how do we make sure that that's also a part um, of what we, um, how we're really being intentional around our commitments and our values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is like a gigantic, obviously, endeavor, right? I mean, this is something that that is really um, ambitious, and it's really clear is going to take more than um, one person, one office, or even a set of people to take this forward. So. Um, how do we start to do that, right? So that's where um, the President's Council on Diversity and Inclusion sort of comes in as a key lever 
that we've envisioned for change. And you'll see here, I love this picture. Um, thanks to our colleague Edwina. If you check it out online, it's got some kind of fun uh, interactive piece, but these are, these are our, uh, this is from our most recent President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion retreat. Um, but the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion is aimed to be really a cross campus body, right? A faculty, staff, alumni, and students um, who together um, work to advance our inclusive excellence goals, right? And, and develop clearer communication channels and help us figure out and identify, like have our, our, our um, fingers on the pulse, of, like really being in conversation and, and, and community with our colleagues across campus, which is to say, what's going on? Like, how is this work, all the activity that's going on, how is it showing up for folks? right? Um, and how is it not showing up for folks, right? What are we noticing that's working, that's really creating that kind of climate and environment that we're aiming for? And, and what is, um, what's not, right? What are some challenges? What are some emergent challenges? And, and, and how do we need to really make sure that we're moving that information all around the organization? Um, so that's how the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion is charged, right? To really be a thought partner, um, to the institution and to be what we call an accountability partner to the institution to say, are we moving on these goals that we've set out for ourselves, right? And how can we collectively make sure that we're bringing our shared um, uh, expertise areas, um, our lived experiences, our, our relationships, right, to bear on our understanding of how we're doing that work. So, what has happened over the years, the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion started um, actually under President Kerwin. Um, that was the first time who's President Burwell's predecessor, for those of you who may be newer to AU, um, was, was the first President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion. And um, every year that, that we've been doing this work, um, the nature and the focus of the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion has changed. And it's changed in a few, um, different ways and, and the reasons that it's changed, right? And the reasons that it's evolved, right? Have to also do with how our institution has, has continued to evolve in terms of our sort of like um, sophistication, right? Around doing this diversity, equity, inclusion work in a, in a sort of strategic way, right? And so when we talk about collaboration, right? That we're, PCDI is supposed to be leading collaboration for this work at AU, like what does that actually mean, <laughs> right? What are we talking about and how has that actually changed uh, over the years? And so, so, so what we're talking about here in this, this arc is, is designed to kind of reflect, you know, different phases of um, our work together as the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion, um, and also different approaches to working together to achieve that goal, right? not just as the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion, but as a whole AU. Um, and, you know, what you'll, what you'll see on the far bottom left is um, this area that we call, um, and I'm going to draw a lot on Adrian Kieser's work, if you know um, uh, any of her work, and I can drop a link in the chat later to give you some context for this, but um, she's an incredible scholar of higher ed and equity at USC. Um, she talks about cooperation, right, as sort of an early phase of how we work together for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's usually aligned with like mobilization, right? When you're first starting to create a plan um, and you're starting to kind of organize the work and getting some buy-in for the work, right? And PCDI in its first iterations was really about cooperating, right? Which means like coordinating, you know, what we do together, like making sure that we're all, we understand what we're all doing, we're sharing information, we're sort of achieving our individual tasks together. That's really that first phase. And this is obviously super important. You've got to do this work. You've got to lay this foundation. But it's also really unlikely to create the kind of deep institutional transformation that we need for the systemic work. Like this is sort of a necessary but insufficient phase as organizations grow and change around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the sort of second phase of the work, which I think is where we are right now, if I'm being honest, um, is this work around collaboration, right? And collaboration is usually when an when a, a institution, a college, a university is kind of implementing a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, right? Um, which is to say, we know what we're trying to do and we're actually now trying to do it, <laughs> right? We've laid out the plan and we're, we're taking action on it. 
and we're trying to energize it. We're trying to make sure that we've got ongoing support for the plan um, over time and through new transitions of leaders and students and faculty and staff um, and in a collaborate in a sort of collaboration phase. That's really work to align efforts right across traditional divides, right? We know we're siloed. Ashley and Bridget talked about this this morning, right? Uh, universities and AU is no different, tend to really do our own work in separate ways, right? Collaboration is really sort of coming together to recognize our shared goals, not to just do our work separately at the same time and understanding how it's related, but really together to say, you know what? Our goals are shared. We're headed in the same direction and let's work together and connect the dots on achieving those goals, right? And so PCDI now is really... Um, in, in the past, we'd work to sort of coordinate the work, right? Develop the phases of the plan, make sure that leadership in particular understood what their goals were and their responsibilities were with different respects to the plan. And now with PCDI, we're really trying to re be very intentional around collaboration. Um, and where we're headed though, and this is where PCDI is, is um, really energized and excited and really where we wanna invite all of us together to think about this piece is into a phase of um, what we're calling, and thanks thanks to William and others at the retreat for coming up with this, co-creation, our third C. Um, and that's really reflective of um, um, where we want to head, which is a more advanced phase of, of this sort of work to transform your institution um, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's where equity work is routine. It's a part of your DNA, right? Um, it's just what we do every day here. And that really is reflective of a felt sense of belonging for everyone. It's not something we just talk about. It's something folks feel and we enact every day, right? And um, during our retreat, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we watched um, a, a video from John Powell um, from, from Berkeley. And he talks about, um, in his othering and belonging work, and he talks about this idea of belonging. Um, and belonging in the way he describes it is co-creative, right? It's not like we've just got this structure, right? Which often reflects sort of dominant, white-centric, right? Um, heteronormative, et cetera, um, structures, ideas, practices. And we're inviting other folks in, right? Come, collaborate with us. No, co-creation is really about together um, building who we'd like to be together. Right? And how do we build the structures and the cultures we'd like to be a part of together, right? That doesn't sort of center any singular identity, lived experience, ways of being, um, set of practices or assumptions, right? But it's really this, this goal to do that work together, to co-create that together um, and to co-determine where we're headed, right? What is the mission for this work? And this is what, you know, Adrian Kieser calls shared equity leadership. Right. And the, what that means um, in this sort of phase of the work, which is really where we want to head, is that everybody in the university is a part of this work and understands that leadership um, is something we all enact together. Right. And it's sort of this this two part phase. And you can see I won't read this out for you. Right. But it's both about personal and organizational transformation. Right? It's how do we as individuals constantly think and rethink and reflect and get critical right, about our lenses on the world? Like, what are we seeing? What are we not noticing? How do we continue to learn and grow about lived experiences, ways of knowing and being that we haven't been exposed to based on our own um, positionalities, based on how we've grown up, based on how we experience the world and how the world experiences us? Right? And simultaneously, right, you're seeing this change in organizational culture. Right, that its individuals are, are sort of moving and growing and the organization is growing at the same time. And instead of just connecting the dots and collaborating and saying, we have the shared vision, let's all do this work. It's really saying, this is our shared work. It's not siloed for one person, for anyone. This is our collective work and really embracing that collective um, in terms of our work. So how do we get there, right? How do, this is our vision, right? This is where we're trying to head is sort of this idea of shared equity leadership. So how do we get there? So I wanna invite my colleagues now um, at PCDI to share a little bit about the ways that in their various schools and colleges and the places um, where they're doing their work for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And each of them you'll hear when they introduce themselves 
actually has a formal role with respect to inclusive excellence or diversity, equity, and inclusion at the institution. Um, and, and the folks here today will have a formal role um, related to a school or a college here at AU. That's something really exciting that's happened over the last five years of the plan. Um, thanks to SOC for being the, the first the first school or college to have a, a, a designated role um, to actually do the work of DEI, right? That doesn't mean this is the only doer of the work. That's the point, right? I want to be clear. Let's keep the shared equity leadership um, idea in our brain, but it's but it's sort of the idea that we want to be intentional, right, about those collaborations, about sort of who's going to help um, uh, envision um, and enact that co-creation that we're all a part of. So I'm going to leave this up here so you can see all of our colleagues, um, but I want to also take the screen off so you can hear them and see them introduce themselves. Um, we're going to talk about sort of so we're going to talk in two buckets, right? About inclusive hiring and retention, like I talked about. Like, how are ways we can actually begin to collaborate together around key outcomes that we know are going to help build belonging here at AU? One of those we know is how do we make sure that we are hiring um, and, and and recruiting, um, whether the faculty, staff, or students, the very best folks um, for the work and the most engaged and enthusiastic members of our community who bring a range of lived experiences and lots of distinct perspectives um, to our work. And how do we make sure that those folks um, stay, right? And have a great experience here. Um, and you'll hear Priya Doshi talk about inclusive hirings and trainings and toolkits that are that that is going on in the provost office, given her role. You'll hear Becca Coughlin talk about SIS and how their sort of work is showing up here. And you'll hear Kareem from SPA talk about um, what's going on in terms of inclusive um, support in, in uh, SPA and building a professional field. And then you're going to hear from our colleagues, um, Nuria uh, Villanova from the College of Arts and Sciences, Lisa Taylor from the Washington College of Law, talking about anti-racist curricular development. Um, as a dimension of building belonging um, in, in, in our schools and colleges. You'll also hear our good colleague, William Thomas, talk about how the School of Education is really applying Professor DeCure's anti-racist mindset and practices framework to build a sense of community and belonging in the School of Education. And you'll hear our good colleague, Gemma Puglisi from the School of Communication, talk about SOC's Inclusive Excellence Week, which is this wonderful sort of series of events where they highlight a lot of work going on across SOC that helps build belonging. So let me stop the share and give you a chance to see my colleagues and have them take it from here. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Priya Doshi. I am the Associate Dean of Faculty and Inclusive Excellence in the Office of the Provost. Um, prior, I'm also a faculty member in the School of Communications, so shout out to SOC again. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the resources that are available AU-wide, and I'm basically going to split these into two buckets. So there are, um, there are uh, resources that are provided through the Dean of Faculty's office, and those include, um, we have just revised the process of briefing search committees for full-time faculty positions. Um, so we do these inclusive practices for search committee briefings, and we offer a number of dates per year, which we then share out with all of the units, and we ask um, every member of a search committee for a full-time faculty role, whether term or tenure track or tenured, to participate in these inclusive practices briefings, which we think are really valuable and important to setting the groundwork for what we're looking to do in terms of widening the pool of applicants that we get. Um, in addition to that, we've created an inclusive hiring toolkit for faculty, which in addition to providing kind of the step-by-step -step pieces of how to request a search and all the steps about um, how to do a search, also has, um, we've woven within it um, inclusive practices at each phase that are research-backed. Um, and then I would also want to point your attention towards some of the mentoring work that we're doing, um, largely through the Advance AU grant. Um, we have a number of initiatives that are running, and I'm going to actually drop into the chat when I'm done talking a list of resources so that you can find all this information on your own. 
But in addition to the good work that the Dean of Faculty's Office is doing, Human Resources is also doing a lot of great work in this field. And so that's for the entire AU community. It's not faculty specific. So um, I would say, you know, for that, you want to reach out to a couple of key people in HR. And again, I will provide their names in the document. I'll, I'll drop into the chat, but Jennifer Scott, Marissa Romero, and um, Shannon Talenko. Um, so they also have an inclusive hiring toolkit and a number of other inclusive excellence resources in hiring. Um, and I'm going to provide you with that link. Um, they also have a number of excellent trainings that they do throughout the year, um, including a really great onboarding training, which Shannon is rolling out. So that's offered monthly, and that's about um, inclusive practices at AU. And again, for anybody, not necessarily just for one category of our community. Um, in addition, they also do um, a lot of onboarding work, um, particularly for faculty and staff managers in terms of, okay, now that people are here, how do you look to make sure their experiences are positive and that they feel like they're a fabric, uh, a part of the fabric of this university? Um, and then lastly, um, Shannon also provided me with a list of the faculty and staff affinity groups. We have eight, um, and that's a great, op great way to get connected to people and also foster a sense of belonging. Um, so I'm going to drop my document here into the chat. I believe it's going to pop. Let's see if it pops up right. Okay, hopefully it'll let you see this, but if not, I will share it out afterwards. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, who's talking after me, Becca? Thanks, Priya. Um, so uh, my name is Becca Coughlin. I'm the um, Associate Director of Graduate Enrollment Management. And within that role, written into the, the position since I've had it, which is 12 years ago, there is a, a strong DEI component, which has become leading DEI initiatives across SAS. And then I have a second role co-chairing our SAS um, Dean's Advisory Council on DEI. So just to kind of situate myself inside SAS, um, and uh, you'll keep hearing about these different ways that each institute, each uh, unit has created a DEI role. Um, so I'm gonna kind of drill down to be a little bit more specific after Priya's nice overview around inclusive hiring work that SIS has done. Um, and uh, this again relates to the toolkits that Priya was mentioning. So uh, a few years ago, SIS was working on creating an inclusive hiring toolkit that would be specific to our field. And in doing some of the research and work on that, I got talking to HR and learned that they were in the process of working on a toolkit as well, an inclusive hiring toolkit. Um, I think one of the ways PCDI has been helpful as well as the inclusive excellence plan is um, helping to reduce the number of times that simultaneous same work has been going on. But that has been a problem at sometimes in the past. So we, we took these conversations and um, began learning a little bit from each other. Um, and, uh, just as SIS finished our toolkit, um, we started talking about how important it would be to not just orient our hiring managers to the toolkit to make sure they're used well and used as far as possible, but also understanding that, um, a toolkit itself is not necessarily what is needed to try to interrupt, uh, places where implicit bias can be, um, impactful in a hiring process. And so what we decided to do next is to create a workshop on um, uh, for, for our, full, our managers of full-time staff. So faculty who manage full-time staff and staff who manage full-time staff were our first group for this. Um, and we decided that we would work on not just an orientation to making use of the toolkit, but also working in a experiential way with scenarios, vignettes, dilemmas, all sorts of real world kind of situations um, to try to help people better understand the ways that implicit bias can continue to seep in. And to also know there's not a recipe for exactly how to stop that from happening, that there's lots of different approaches. So we took a very hands-on approach. We at first decided to work on training a handful of folks to be our inclusion partners, and then made it clear that hiring managers could pull one of these people um, into their hiring committee. Um, and then we realized how complex and difficult it was to manage all of the um, sort of logistical issues of working that way. And we also, I think, got a lot of buy-in for mandating um, all uh, managers or full-time staff uh, participating in this workshop. 
And that that then simplifies things. If every hiring manager has had this training and experience, uh, then they're better equipped to work on hiring process. So we went in that direction um, as sort of a phase two approach. And um, at one point had about 90% of our uh, managers of full-time staff trained. Um, now we've had some turnover. So I do also not wanna paint too rosy of a picture. All of us have bandwidth struggles. Um, all of us have a lot of competing demands. So where we are now is in need of offering more of these workshops for folks who are new after some turnover and faculty who have taken on manager roles who didn't used to have those. So um, we're working on that to make this an ongoing um, useful uh, process. But we had very good feedback from the workshop, especially I learned from our feedback evaluations um, because of them being so interactive um, and uh, example-based. And uh, we learned that um, not only would 100% um, say that they learned something helpful in an in inclusive hiring process, but 100% also reported that they learned something helpful to be more inclusive in their everyday work. And some comments even said, um, this is, would be useful for everyone, not just in the hiring context. So those are some things we're continuing to think about. I'd invite any of you who are looking at inclusive hiring processes, wanting to not reinvent the wheel or take whatever is useful from what SIS has done um, to reach out. I'd be happy to have conversations about that. At this point, I am going to turn things over to Kareem. Hey, folks. Good afternoon. So my name is Kareem Jordan. I am I'm a faculty me member in SPA, in SPA. I'm also the director of diversity and inclusion over in SPA. Um, role I've had now for roughly give or take about four years or so. So on the faculty side, um, a bit more here, some of the stuff we're doing over in SPA, uh, very brief, briefly here, you know, because part of the our arguments about why sometimes the faculty are not as diverse, not just at AU, but in many places is, oh, we have, we didn't have enough folks in the pool. We didn't have a strong enough pool, you know, all of those things. So one thing that we have um, is this postdoctoral fellowship Pro, uh, pro, uh, a program that's geared more towards trying to um, add to the diversity of the of our actual fields. So we have a postdoc program for people who are finishing their who are finishing their their actual degrees who may not necessarily, for instance, be the strongest right there at that point. So we have a postdoc program that's uh, that that they can have for up to two years or so. As part of that program, there's mentorship, there's collaboration when it comes to research, um, giving resources on how to write grants. There's a teaching component also where they teach one class per uh, per term. Um, but the goal from this program is for them to be able to hit the academic market stronger with research, more professional experience, experience up in their background. And of all the postdocs that we had in SPA so far, some are doing, they are doing extremely well. One is going up for tenure now at AU. She was so great, we tried to keep her and we did. Um, you know, somebody else is at Temple uh, in Philly. She's doing well. We got some in California and all of us. So folks are doing extremely well. So we hope that, again, we can help build the bench with strong scholars um, to take away one more, at least come back to folks say, like, why don't you have a more diverse, you know, well, faculty of in your department? Um, we have a mentorship committee, you know, that spans across all of the departments within SPA. Also, you know, we try to mentor all of the junior fac faculty within the department, but we do specifically focus on those from Un, from underrepresented groups also. We talk about faculty of color, um, women, you know, because again, sometimes, many times, you know, um, those groups are left behind. Folks don't help, you know, whether it's built in or whatever it is. So we actually try, you know, to help those groups. We meet with junior faculty. We give them guidance, advice, written feedback on things they can do and solicit feedback on things that we can do also to help so support them. Um, one of the other things that we're doing specifically on the faculty side. So in SPA, we have a DEI committee. I see one or two people on that committee now who are in this uh, group here. 
But one of the things that we, we're going to be doing over the course of the semester, which hopefully be done by the end of the spring, is having a strategic plan on, on you know, regarding, D, regarding DEI on issue. How do you recruit and retain diverse groups? We're talking about students, faculty, staff, you know, because sometimes we're very good at being able to recruit folks, but don't do necessarily as well when it comes to being able to retain those groups. So those are just some of the things I know where you know, competing against time here. So uh, I, I, you know, that's a quick type of, you know, uh, overview of what we're doing over in SPA. Um, I will turn it over to Noria and Lisa, I think are next. Thank you so much, Karin. And this is Noria Villanova. Thank you everybody for being here. And I want to thank, and I'm sure on behalf of my colleagues here, Amanda for the amazing work that she's done. She has not only been a champion for AU in terms of inclusive excellence and DEI, she has been literally our glue. I think that we can say now, and this is an important part of what we do, that probably we don't have those silos that we always talk about anymore. I do feel that those um, silos have might have gone away because we do work very closely one with another. So um, I am the associate dean of undergraduate studies and also the DI liaison in the college. That position has always fall on that. So those positions have gone together in the college and the DI liaison was inaugurated in 2018 at the very same time that um, the College of Arts and Science created the DI fellows coming from the faculty. It's four fellows, they serve for two years each and they belong to one of the four clusters, disciplinary clusters of the college. So the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and the STEM or sciences, quantitative natural sciences. So we do um, think very carefully about this kind of representation. We want to make sure that you know all these different disciplinary corners are represented and we work together. We have 19 departments. The departments have also created their own DI committees. They have their own works and um, they do their own activities, but we do coordinate quite a lot from the Dean's office. This, the fellows work with me, I work with them. And we also have a DEI committee, which is um, the fellows, the four fellows, plus the postdoc. We have two postdocs for academic diversity, and then we have a postdoc from Ukraine and a postdoc for Afghan, Afghanistan. Those were created as, we, they don't have this title, but kind of a scholars at risk um, situation. And we do have those two postdocs as well. So all these colleagues of mine and myself and the director of a program that we have for a student that is called CAS LEAD and is leadership, ethnic, ethical leadership. All these people form the committee and we work on several things, we coordinate with the, the, the you know, with the departments. We have organized workshops, and probably our kind of signature, um, you know, activity was a document created in 2020 that is an anti-racist development curriculum document. So I will put it in the chat. It's open. It's live. It's in our website. And this document is live. So we work on it on a very continuous, regular basis. So it has also the four corners are represented there with best practices, with some kind of, you know, recommendations, with links to different resources. And we also created in 2020 the mini grants for collaboration in issues related to the EI. Um, some colleagues in the economics department created videos from professors who are in different parts of the world, the way they would teach economics from Africa or from Asia, from different corners of the world. We had another collaboration between music professors at the STEM. We also had some work done. And I have to say that, you know, we, there are some disciplines that per se seem to be more inclined to incorporate DEI because it's in the, you know, it's in their self, like sociology, anthropology, 
the cultural studies, CRGC, the cultural race and cultural studies and sexual and, and women and gender sexuality. But I have to say, and this is something I want to emphasize, that the STEM departments have done an amazing work as well. We have a DI committee in biology and also in physics they have been very active, chemistry. So I think this is something that also is important for us to know. And with that, I hope we have the opportunity to, to talk a little bit more when we meet you know, in the small groups or anytime you want to discuss anything, I'm always available. I will pass it on to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, uh, and thank you everyone for being here. My name is Lisa Sonia Taylor. I am the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at uh, the College of Law, and I also have oversight over our Martha Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project, and uh, I am currently Chair of our DEI Faculty Committee. Um, at the College of Law, uh, we consider how the curriculum affects our community and belonging uh, at the law school, particularly uh, in the first year where students take mostly mandated doctrinal courses. And doctrinal courses in legal educational in education traditionally do not incorporate critical perspectives uh, into the syllabus. Um, so students who come to law school with this burning desire to help their community sometimes feel gaslit. By, by the first year curriculum. And this can affect, affect their sense of community and belonging and their ability to engage at law school and sometimes their academic outcomes. So while WCL as a whole has a broad curriculum that incorporates, incorporates uh, courses that consider how the law impacts diverse communities, the 1L curriculum uh, has largely remained untouched. Um, however, recent changes in the ABA, uh, in ABA standards now require that all law schools introduce students in the first year to issues of race, cultural competency, and bias. Um, so uh, beginning this year in our orientation, we had a really successful collaboration with faculty and administrative offices that play a large role in the professional development of our students. So basically what we did is we threw out the bath water uh, in orientation, but we kept the baby, right? We built a truly student-centered program that made sure that students understood why what they were supposed to learn in orientation. We weren't just throwing things at them. And we have three pillars during this orientation. One was uh, introducing them to the academics. Uh, the second was introducing them to the resources that were there for them. And the third was introducing them to our mission of surrounding commu community building, right, both internally and externally. And this third pillar, uh, students were introduced to these mandated concepts uh, of cultural competency bias and racism, um, as well as pro professional identity formation and wellness, uh, issues around wellness. Uh, students were then required to participate in weekly workshops. Well, required, I'll put quotes around that, in weekly workshops uh, that included implicit bias training, cultural competency workshops, as well as inclusive leadership uh, workshops. And we had really successful, um, we did this through our Compass program and our Dean's Professionalism a certificate, and we had a, a large number of our students complete the program um, this year. Additionally, uh, student empowerment is, is key to us, particularly for our first year students. Um, my office collaborated with a core group of student activists on campus, as well as our Office of Public Interest and other faculty to think about how the issues of race and oppression uh, show up in, in our curriculum and how they affect the, the law and the lawyer's role in the legal system. And this led to a 1L uh, elective class uh, that is being taught for the first time this semester. It's called Critical Perspectives on Law, Legal Education, and Lawyering. Um, and it's going to be taught by Professor Brandon Weiss. Uh, we were really happy to have that elective in the first year. 
Um, and as a part of that effort, I am actually teaching a course this semester for the first time on movement luring as an alternative um, theory to um, public interest. Uh, luring. So those are the kinds of things we thought that was a really great effort in empowering our students uh, through the curriculum because it was really a student driven effort. So I'll stop there. I see Amanda's giving me the thumbs up. So I'm going to uh, stop there so I can turn it over to William. William uh, Thomas. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is William. I am a professorial lecturer in the School of Education. I particularly focus in with the doctoral students. I'm the director of the doctoral program there, but I also am a faculty fellow with the AUX program. And um, this this unique role has, you know, um, given me an interesting insight as it relates to equity, and also has pushed me to, you know, be involved with our equity, justice, and community committee. So. I'm really excited to just talk to you a little bit about how we've leveraged the the use of anti-racism as a key practice, as a as, as a key um, a springboard to really building community. A lot of times when we think about and study anti-racist practices, we think about the dismantling, the disruption, the resistance, um, but we don't talk a lot about the community, especially that vulnerable community that's created. And so we've used a variety of different resources, particularly some internal resources that we've created um, in the School of Education, particularly Dr. Mark DeCure, who's created a, um, a framework that helps us really anchor us uh, in particularly four key elements of anti-racist mindsets and practices. Um, I'll, I'll share a document in the chat just if you all want to see some of the things. But one of the first things we did is we changed, you know, our name from DEI to Equity, Justice and, Com and Community to make sure that we're focusing in on community. And then we really started to push on making sure we use this framework to help organize and frame our meeting space and making sure that we're hitting all these different elements in our conversations, making sure that our community builders are really anchored in humanizing others. But then going a step further and making sure we're starting to norm in, in regards to language and, and what does the word equity mean to you and, and what, what, what does research say equity means and how are we contextualizing it in various contexts. Um, and then with that, you know, we, we, we realized that the biggest piece that we needed to zero in on is building capacity amongst our, our um, school of education, but in particularly through, com uh, through community. And so we've really been springboarding these uh, uh, podcast listening groups where each semester we have a, a, a moment where we have folks from all over the, the school come in and, and talk about a particular podcast that we've been listening to for the past semester and, and have some critical dialogue and be in community um, and understand that that vulnerable space that we're all in trying to do this equity work, um, you know, there's 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 others who are doing it, and so um, excited to to collaborate and expand, and and when we get into small groups, answer any questions definitely about the the great work that the School of Education is doing, and and helping you know and learning from as well um, from from other spaces. So I'll pass it on to I think uh, Gemma. To me, hi everybody. I'm going to be real quick. It's me before the breakout session. So just real quick, I'm the diversity director from the School of Communication. I've been here 20 years. Our really signature thing here in the SOC is we were one of the first to have a DEI committee. I'm very proud of that. We're going to have it. We always have it the week before uh, spring break. This year, it's going to be March 4th through the 8th. We're going to kick it off with some kind of an uh, event where we would be working with uh, some of our college uh, folks and university uh, folks from the DMD Virginia area and talk about best practices. It's great. We're in this great city and it's great to have all these universities come and talk about it. Just really quickly, last year, some of the things that we did during this week was we had a panel discussion on trans life at the university. We invited uh, wonderful associate professor Perry Zern to talk about that. We had a student who represented AU Pride to talk about what we can do to help uh, trans students feel more supportive. Uh, we also filmed a preview screening of she said, which was a film based on the book by New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, uh, Megan and Jody, who chronicled uh, Harvey Weinstein's uh, sexual misconduct. We had donuts with the dean. We had a KPU and uh, partnered with them on a, a great um, woman who uh, Nebula Noor, my colleague Priya Doshi got her and she's a prominent influencer. And she talked to students about that. And then finally, we um, had a, a great panel discussion with students who are editors of, of the um, Black Print, uh, of the Eagle, and um, AWOL. And they talked about some of the challenges that they face in terms of covering everything DEI. It is That is it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda so we can get started. Thank you. 
All right. So thanks to my awesome colleagues. So excited to actually have some time to begin to um, sit together and be in conversation. So um, I've put Amanda, you just got mute. You just went on mute. Oh, sorry. I put a couple of questions in the chat. I, if you can see that. Oh, can you see them, Becca? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I can hear there you, but I can't see. We can hear you. We can't see the questions in the chat. Okay. okay. Well, you can hear me. We're gonna go ahead and break. Go into breakouts. So we've got some good time. We'll take about um, fifteen minutes in our breakouts. Um, so now let's talk about how we can move this. What might help you collaborate? more effectively for equity. What questions are front of mind for you? What do you want to know more about? So our CTRO partners, if you could take us to um, the breakouts, that would be awesome. And we'll see you in about 15 minutes. always like a really good appetizer. So, so um, thank you for, for being a part of our, our appetizer, appetizer, and thanks to this whole crew. I'm aware we're short on time. Um, so hopeful what we can do is ask everyone who's, who's stuck with us thus far, just to pop in the chat, like as you reflect on co-creation and collaboration, like what is one word you're taking away from this time together? What is one word or phrase? That you're taking away and pop it in the chat. The one word or phrase you're taking away. Thank you, Bridget. Awesome. And as we do this, we want to leave you with, I'm seeing shared space, vulnerability, <laughs> Sean, mm -hmm. you club. Jane, I know is up there for the you club too. <laughs> um, opportunity collective, you know, Yes, how we need to be in community, right? It's not just about talking about community, we gotta do it, right? William was talking about this in the break. We're gonna be community, we gotta do community. That's gotta be really the focus of the work on so many levels. Um, so as we close out, we have one last slide that has a couple of things we hope you'll take away. Um, and we also will share out a list of all the aggregated resources in case you missed them. Um, so let me really quickly just show you a couple of takeaways here. Um, so we want you to stay connected with us and with each other in lots of different ways. Here's a couple of ways you can do it. We're hoping you'll share some PCDI action items with your networks. We're going to follow up with those to everybody after the chat. We hope you'll come meet 
and greet our new Vice President for Inclusive Excellence in Kenji Friday, Dr. Kenji Friday. She's starting next week. Um, we also want to invite you to reach to a PCDI member to invite them to a breaking bread at the bridge. Free coffee and bread, which is like a pastry or a uh, bagel on PCDI. If you reach to any member in this call and ask them to a coffee or a tea on us. We hope that you'll send any ideas and connections to ie at american.edu. You can get to each of us that way. Um, and, and follow, I'm going to follow up on this later, but if y'all are on Instagram, check out District of Inclusivity. Um, and if you have questions on that, talk with Priya um, more about it. It's a, it's a way that we're getting our students in collaboration with each other around this work. So we hope you'll follow it. And then finally, we hope you'll join a faculty and staff affinity group. Um, to continue to build some of these connections um, or the idea network. If you're not a part of it and want to be a part of it, it's kind of a broader frame than PCDI for lots of different colleagues who'd like to be um, and are active parts of this work across campus. So with that, um, I will say thank you and ask you to please remember to take a minute to fill out the evaluation, which our CTRL colleagues have dropped in the chat. And thanks to each and all of you for all the work you do every day. Um, you know, it, 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 it matters. And, and we appreciate each of you. We look forward to staying in collaboration. Take care, everybody. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you.